welcome once again to the How Long to Beat podcast with me, Rick, as always, joined by Alex and Paula. Uh, E3's going on, but you're not going to know it because we're uh, we're probably not going to talk about anything new this week. Um, so we're going to talk, as always, about what we've beaten, retired and been playing. Um, we're going to hit a topic this week, which is uh, Alex's wheelhouse. I'm going to leave that for him to explain when we get there uh, to you guys and to me, because I, I actually haven't even looked over it in the show notes. Um, and then we'll finish off with a question from the community and everyone's favourite game. How long, How long to, to beat the, the game? game. The game. Oh. Past few have been on point. We're getting better. I don't normally say that, but they, they feel like they're actually hitting. But then in the recording, they probably just won't. Um, <laughs> yeah, so we, we've um, a little bit inside of baseball. This is about 72 hours from the last episode, which, which at the time of recording has just dropped. Uh, somehow we've all got completions um, mm-hmm. And by completions, like there's there's six games, but four of them are little browser things. <laughs> we, we, we're somewhat <laughs> cheating. Um, Alex, why don't you kick us off with one of the two proper games? Sure. Yeah, I beat. Although mine is quite short too. I beat Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Four: Turtles in Time on the SNES Classic. Uh, this game's dope. I, I I really enjoyed this game. It's short, obviously. It's about like an hour ten minutes. Um, although it does that thing where when you beat it, it's like Master Splinter's just kind of like, "Good job, bud." You haven't completed the final challenge. Beat the game in hard mode <laughs> to prove that you're a real Cal- ninja. Ninja. <laughs> Yeah, right? And I was like, oh, is this your way of saying, like, oh, don't stop playing now. I know it's short, but... Uh. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's short for a reason, I promise. Yeah, it's not It's not that hard of a game, which I actually appreciated. Like, Ultimately, the final boss is actually like kind of a joke. Um, to be honest, like once you understand the pattern, you just kind of have to walk around, wait, and go punch, 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 uh, which was like a bit of a letdown because most of the bosses were really fun. Um, it's classic kind of 10 stages, beat them up. You go through some like really, the first five are kind of like, you know, would almost be like a traditional Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game. And then you go in time and then the final five are like themed uh, versions. And I just thought it was really, it was a really clever um, way of doing it you know you can play with all the different turtles and they all have different abilities you know obviously you can play two player if you want which i think would be super fun doing that and it's just like it's beautiful um pixel art you know it's of that era where pixel art was just getting like totally mastered and totally perfected and yeah it's just i don't know it, it was just satisfying um it never felt cheap which is something that like that uh, you know that spider-man one i told you about kind of felt cheap most of the time but in this one it actually felt like you know, there were techniques that worked better on different uh, people, but you didn't have to just use one thing, right? Like when I, some, I find some beat-em-ups, it's like they introduce an enemy and it's like, well, the way you beat this enemy is by doing this move. (laughs) Never read a boy. But um, (laughs) there are, (laughs) then there's good ones where it's like, no, there is a tactic that works better on this enemy, but you can still use a variety of ways to take the enemy down. And I really appreciate that because it didn't feel like I was getting locked into a play style I was going through. It was like, no, okay, you can do this or you can like mix things up and you could pick up this guy and you could bash, bash, bash. And like, I don't know. I just appreciated it. It never felt like it was like one note. Um, So yeah, it's a good game. I recommend playing it, especially if you have one of the SNES classics. Hack that thing and dump it on there because my God. Which also, Mm, by the way. I was gonna say. I was just gonna say much more... <laughs> God, you go. Up. You go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I was just gonna say <laughs> that um, if you hack your SNES Mini, it does this incredible thing where, on the SNES Mini itself, you have to press the reset thing in order to go back to the menu and like do your save states, which fucking sucks because like if you're up close that thing yeah you gotta go back and forth but i have an 8-bit dough um one of their snes controllers like i had one anyway and it was also one with the thumbsticks but uh i bought their little receiver for it so i can play wirelessly and when you hack it you can just um, hold select and press down and it will automatically bump you into that uh menu so it effectively creates like it's so much better like as i'm playing i can just boom, easily go out and do that so if you're listening and you have a snes mini Fucking go to Hack Cheat. Get that shit right now. Even if you are like against ROMs and you don't want to like, you know, uh, download them or some shit, doesn't matter because it'll keep all your normal ones. So you can do that anyway with your regular yeah. games. So there, there's literally no downside to this. Um, oh, that extends to all the things like Vita, PSP, all the consoles, you name it. Like there's functionality that just the first parties can't be fucked putting their 
but actually you would quite like and it is worth doing for that alone uh, much more enthusiastic about turtles in time now i know it's that short i don't know why i thought i had it in my head as like a four hour thing but no. makes sense that it would be quite compressed yeah huh yeah, that's it um paolo do you want yeah. to tell us about what you've been playing what you beat i should say hey um i will start with the uh, Cecil Richards one that are mm-hmm. beach bombing and Continental Drift. And those are two of the earlier uh, releases by this creator. Uh, so beach bombing is doesn't really have like a message like the other titles, but it was still like quite charming. And Continental Drift, I think this is where uh, Cecil Richards like found the the style of the of the newer titles hmm. um still it was like not quite there kind of felt but i still enjoy it um again these are like five minute games so you don't really like lose anything by playing them and you may find something you really like yeah, yeah. and the one uh like real completion i got this week was is the Liar Princess and the Blind Prince on Nintendo Switch, and this is a replay. Uh, because this month later, later this month, the another game from the same creators is coming out. So I, was, I wanted like to get all the collectibles on the first game, and I can't emphasize enough how beautiful this game looks, and how. Beautiful, it sounds to you like. Um, I don't think I, I how I talk about like the premise of the game or not. Very briefly, last week, I think, yeah, okay. it's like a, ago, a, a princess who's a werewolf, and there's a whole like thing where she's deceiving the guy, and like okay. there's a whole proper story behind it. it. It's fuzzy in my head, but I think we have touched on it, okay? So uh, the story is about like this uh, wolf that lives in the forest and has a like a beautiful singing voice. And every night she stands like at the top of a cliff and sings to the moon. And one night a human appeared, a prince from a neighboring kingdom, and sit there, sat there like on the base of the cliff and listened to the voice. And the wolf like was like, "Huh, uh, that looks like a midnight night." I'm going to finish singing and then go eat him. But when she finished th- singing, the prince started clapping because of her performance. And the wolf was like, huh, we're human, just run off. And it became like this kind of routine where every night the prince will come, would come to listen to her and then clap at the end of the, of the performance and praise her for her singing. One night, the prince... Uh, there was no clapping after the performance, and the prince was almost at the top of the cliff because he wanted to see uh, the person in his mind who was singing. The wolf became scared and trying to cover his eyes so he wouldn't see her, he wounded him. The, and the prince lost his, his sight, and he was, um, he was found by a soldier um brought to the castle and locked in the tower because um i don't know he brought shame to family or something so the princess so the wolf sorry went to the uh first witch's house and asked her for a human form so she could bring the prince to her and heal his eyes because um so uh, after that, the mechanic becomes that you are able to, you move the princess, you control the princess, and she can shift between the form of a wolf and the princess. Uh, and you have to use both so you can bring the, the prince to the witch's house. And... Um, so yeah, that uh, that's the whole premise of the game, and it was quite entertaining because like the the prince, you can actually like kind of control him his movements too later in the game, 
because the more like uh, they travel together, like uh, the princess can give her give him instructions, like uh, walk here, um, pick up the item, and drop the item and stuff like that. Uh, quite simple, but it is enough to make like a very interesting puzzle because the princess, for example, cannot uh, pick anything on fire, like a lantern, because she's scared of it, because she's a monster. But the prince uh, can, and he can just blindly carry it to the nearest torch and just light everything up. Yeah, it's like uh, the Kuro, isn't it? It's like a, a 2D puzzle platform escort mission type thing. Yeah, uh, that is precisely what it is. And uh, it is very puzzle focused. It has a little bit of combat because you still have to protect the prince from the many, many creatures that are in the forest, uh, such as. And I really love the art of the game because they are the the creatures are named like after very normal animals, but it's like not what you imagine them to be. Right. And there's these little caterpillar things that are fuzzy and cute, and dangerous, and they are called raccoons. The goat doesn't look like a goat; it eats meat. <laughs> hmm. And there's like these little bear-like things that live underground that are moles. Uh, the game itself is like very whimsical. The puzzles are simple in principle, but sometimes some are not harder to execute, but they have a bit of timing to them. Because they're like these flowers that you hit as a wolf, and they will fire a, a little pebble thingy, for example. But since they are moving, you have to time it correctly so they hit what you want, to, want them to hit. Um, some of the puzzles are riddles. And holy fuck, there's one level where you could just walk to the end of the level or take the long road. And I was stamped on the riddle on the on the long road. Uh, because you had to go to four places to get like the the four pieces of riddle and then like uh solve it. And I think that's the part of the game that took me the longest. And it's, it's stuff like that, which is why I never finish puzzle games, because I'd just get frustrated on two or four. <laughs> I'd just be like, Ugh. Yeah. Yeah. Because that, that's... I mean, Go on, sorry. In that level, you could skip that, because the only thing you're missing is, like, the, the five petals that are in the level. So it's like, you could do the puzzle and probably, like, get everything in the level. Or if it proves to be, like, too difficult, you can either google it or skip it. There's like an option to skip the the, the level in that part. Uh so that's that's the game. Uh also I I wasn't reading my notes, I was reading like the little um storybook oh, that came yeah. with the physical edition. I thought I saw little pictures. There you go. Yeah. Like it, it the physical edition comes with an actual storybook of the game with like um and of course it doesn't like tell you like the ending of the game but it gives you like a prologue to what happens and i found it like it, this is like literally one of the best physical editions i've seen and it was priced at uh, a normal retail price i think it was like 40 bucks when so yeah that is the um liar princess and blade prince i highly recommend it Nice. It is a bit on the easier side, but still, if you like games with uh, very unique concepts or art styles in general, I think you're gonna like this one. Hmm. And Rick, you're you're next. Yes, I'm 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 the person that's not finished any proper games. I uh, I actually played both of these games earlier today. Um, I've I've had them open as as tabs in my browser for a couple of weeks and. Uh, with the recording coming up, I thought, well, now, now's a good time to actually sort of knock them on the head. Uh, the first of these is a game for the Ludum Dare game jam um, by Sukaban Games, the developers behind uh, Valhalla and the upcoming Nirvana. Uh, it's called One Shot in the Dark, Now I'm Dead. And it's a narrative game about you trying to piece together the truth behind a cataclysmic event that happened in the past for the character. It feels a little bit like a 
guided linear sort of version of her story because you're going through audio logs, videos, articles, but the AI that's helping you to piece together what's happened um, is essentially drip feeding those elements to you. The story's a little bit holy. I think that that's just a, a byproduct of it being a game jam game and something that's come together very, very quickly. But it gripped me the whole way through. It's really nicely put together. The music's wonderful. I actually went and got my headphones just so I could sort of get it in my ear holes a little bit better. It's beautiful music. Um, and it's it's well worth a look. It's quite it's quite girthy. It took me just over half an hour to play. Um, and I really enjoyed all of that time. The other game uh, is called Ride. And this is, if you can picture it, an endless runner, but developed in, in Bitsy. So like the, the same program that Steel Richard used for her stuff. It's like the one bit thing. Uh, but it's turn-based. So the, the road only moves when you move. It's like an endless thing. There's not, not a specific challenge. It's something that's just been sort of put together. Uh, but it was, a, it was a nice sort of two-minute diversion. There's like a day and a night version. If you pull over to the side, it's like, oh, rest until nightfall. And there's a different music and the, the color palette just completely changes. It's nice. Good two minute little thing. No more and no less than that, really. I've also not, I'll talk about this a little bit more in the playing, almost finished a proper game. Uh, so I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, shall I segue us through to the retirements now? Mm-hmm. Yeah, why don't, well, why don't I go and then you can go and then that way you've got yourself a nice little. Fine. We got to vary it up for the listeners, <laughs> <Yeah>. Rick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. also i'm very curious about this retirement i thought I you were enjoying yeah. it yeah i was I surprised pikachu in the show notes it's actually not like honestly it's not very much to it I-, I retired dicey dungeons i thought i was going to beat this game but i started playing there's one character called the witch and um it's the most difficult character in the game and i just couldn't be bothered to try and beat it because like Essentially, I I beat all of the dice characters except for two of the jester levels and then the witch levels. So there are six in total. And so I was kind of like, you know, I, I know I could beat this, but it was starting to turn into the like Hades thing where I was like, uh oh, I'm going to have to play this for like another like four hours or so. And I'm going to have to like get that one real lucky run, you know, like before I felt like I was kind of like going through and it was like I could really change things up and I had more control and now I sort of felt like I was like okay now I'm kind of relying on luck here um, and on who I see less than on strategy and that just kind of rubbed me the wrong way and I was like "Mm, I don't I don't want to I don't want to beat this it's not really worth it like I've got more than enough enjoyment out of it I I think I I, like when I tabulated all my times using that like you know parental controls thing on the switch it was like 25 hours Mm -hmm. I played it for so I was like Fucking no complaints yeah. here. Like, I got my money's worth. I think I paid 11 bucks for it. I was like, I did good. <laughs> um, but You're I, putting your gamer credentials into question here, though. Oh, I could have beat it if I really wanted to. Yeah, but that's like any mm-hmm. roguelike. They're, they're, not, they're not that hard. Like, Hades isn't that hard. You just have to actually, like, because arguably you can beat Hades on your first go if you want. Like, it's not that difficult. It's just the fact that you need to understand strategies. Like, there's speedrunners who go, like, ham on that. And, like, I never found myself when I played Hades, I never found it particularly, like, difficult. I found sometimes I would get overwhelmed and I would make mistakes. But I never felt like I was like, oh, this game is so punishingly hard. It's like, well, no, not really. Like, I just had to be smart about it. And I have to like... Is that not difficulty, though? Is that not a distinction without a difference? What? I got overwhelmed and <laughs> made mistakes. Is that not difficulty? No, I just think it's good. It's Where you're good throwing game more design. things at you. I'm thinking of difficulty in the sense of like, um, like arbitrary difficulty. That's more what I'm thinking about. Like um, in the sense of where it's like sometimes you have a game where you're just like, oh, fuck, you're doing this thing where it's like... I don't know, where you're like gating progress or something. You know what I mean? Like in that sort of sense where it's like you have to like level up or something in order to beat this thing. Even if you even if you like did all the best strategies, it like wouldn't matter. Like that's kind of what I'm when I think about when I think of like really intense difficulty or like broken mechanics, like um like the Spider Man one. Um, I'm also thinking of older shit games. So like in that Spider-Man game, you go to play it and it's really hard because it sucks. <laughs> like to actually beat it is really <laughs> difficult because the mechanics are so fucking jank and broken that it's like, I can't do it. It's just busted. Whereas a game like Hades is expertly crafted. So it's like, I don't find the game to be like annoyingly hard. It's challenging, um, which I, which is fun. But like when I go into it, I know that like, 
because it's designed well, I know that I can beat it. It's not like saying you'll never win. It's saying like you can win. It's just going to take you a lot of work. And that's what I felt Dicey Mm. Dungeons was doing in this moment. And I was like, okay, I see. It's just like, I have to make the value judgment. Do I want to put in more time now? Or do I want to bounce off while I'm enjoying it? Um, I've made, this is how I make my decisions often with games. It's like, I look at it and I go, the experience thus far, has it been fair? Has it been enjoyable? And it's like, yes, it has. So I'm, I'm usually like calculating that it's probably not going to get suddenly like completely cheap. It's just that it's going to really challenge everything that I've learned. And I just don't have time for that. <laughs> you know, there's so many good games and I don't want to master it in order to beat that part. You know what I mean? I want to just like get out while I'm enjoying it. This is what I love about our little podcast. My throwaway joke about you not getting good has just turned into a, a discussion on the definition of difficulty. Yeah, well, I don't know. That's <laughs> <Yeah>. you asked. <laughs> yeah, I'm, 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 technically, yeah. Yeah. You I was asked, trying to I'm find an equivalent. Yeah, I was oh. trying to find an equivalent. I thought about like the level jump. I talked about uh, last podcast with Pokemon Soul Silver, mm. and I think I know what you mean there. Yeah, it's like the mechanics, you know, when you see that giant jump, you're like, okay, well, the, none of the mechanics are going to suddenly change on me. It's just that you're like, I'm just going to have to fucking grind through to get there. <laughs> and you're like, is that worth mm-hmm. it? I don't know. For some people, they're like, hell yeah. But like for Rick, and since you were like, like, for instance, beating red in the end of Pokemon Soul Silver is not hard. It just requires a time commitment. You know what I mean? And it's like, yeah, right. It's a level progression. Yeah, that, that, mm-hmm. that's almost what I'm saying. That's not difficulty. Thank it's you. Not you agree with me. That's, that's exactly what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying these aren't difficult. You're literally just progressing because, like, roguelikes have a different level progression than than games like Pokemon. The level progression is learning the systems. They're the same thing. Oh. It's just in different in different um, costumes. Maybe. I mean, you, you were talking about just like increased numbers of enemies as being not a difficulty thing, which I think that is. I don't think that's a level progression thing. Increased level I mean, progression is the HP. Thing? But depending on how you do it, it can be a cheap difficulty thing. Oh yeah, it, it's cheap. I'm not. It's not. I'm not disputing yeah. that it can be cheap. I'm just disputing that it, it's not a difficulty thing. Uh huh. Sorry. Because wait, when you, did I talk about increased enemies? More enemies that's, I don't know. Uh, you, you said uh, when there were so many. I got overwhelmed by lots of enemies, people. and then I make mistakes. Oh no, no, no. Not Sorry, I got thing. overwhelmed. I'm saying that I would get overwhelmed in a game. Yeah. Not by enemy, not by multiple enemies. I'd get overwhelmed by my systems, and I'd, I'd fuck ah, up. Do you see yeah. what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now we're on the same page. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Sorry, no, I didn't mean like, oh my god, suddenly there's tons. Of- no, no, no. That that was all right. It was more just like I'd be like, shit, fuck my call. Like, I, I, you know what I mean? And like, I was there's so like, so many of them. Ah! Yeah, it was more like the fact where I'm like, fuck, what do I have to? Pre- which one do I have? What am I using? And then like, I would just get overwhelmed and go like, ah, shit, and I'd mess up, right? And I'd I'd misdo something, and I I wouldn't do the right thing. I'm also a bit like you, where I like to go in hard and fast. And that fucks me up a lot in games like that. <laughs> phrasing. Uh, hey. <laughs> we both had phrasing. Earlier you said girth. I was like, it's a girthy game. And I went, ooh, ooh. No, I don't like that. Uh, but I think I think we uh, all roundaboutly agree on what we're saying here. Um, ultimately, yeah. Yeah. It's it's look, it's the Dark Souls thing, right? Like Dark Souls is a great game in the sense that you can look at that game and you know that it's it's like it's difficult, but the reality is like it is beatable. People beat it, but you have to look at it and go, <sighs> I know I'm going to have to spend a lot of time in order to beat this game because they're going to have to really learn it. And you have to make the decision like, is that what I want to spend my time on? Um, for some what people, I've heard like, about yeah. Dark Souls is like at some point you you start thinking and you're still like feeling the game. And that's mm-hmm. where in, uh, that's when you, it actually works for you. It's, yeah. it's it, it's interesting that, that that could be a discussion for another day. Now, yeah, I'm it. actually going to talk more about this when I get to my playing. But it, it's the question of um, like oftentimes for a game to really hit you in the flow state, you have to learn how to use its systems well. So like mm-hmm. hard games, it's just the reality is you're just going to have to kind of like hit against the wall for a while until you can really enter into that flow. Um, but when you do enter it, it's, it's beautiful. But there's only so many games and so much time in the world. So you got to kind of choose what games you want to enter into that with. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, yeah. Anyway, that's uh, Dicey Dungeons. I-, I still really recommend this game. Look, it's a roguelike, right? You don't have to beat these games. They're kind of like arcade games in some ways. Just play them until <laughs> you had your fill and then leave. Um, and that's what I'm doing. I'm just saying, thank you. This is great. Bye-bye. <laughs> uh, Rick, what about you, though? You retired one that sad face for you, I think. Yeah. Mm, it- it's one I might come back to, but I have retired for now at least my replay of Mirror's Edge Catalyst. I... <laughs> 
when I came to this second run, it was with the mindset that I'm going to skip all the story bollocks because the story barely ex- it exists, <laughs> yeah. but it barely justifies itself. And when I played through the first time, I basically mained the campaign and didn't really do much of the open world guff, by which I mean there's there's fragile delivery missions, there's time trials, there's also, and I now realize that they're procedurally generated, i.e. there's a specific start point, but the end point will differ every time you approach them. Uh, some of these other delivery runs, and I'm, I'm convinced that some of them are broken, uh, that short of breaking the game with speedrun tactics, you can't actually get a realistic time in some of these. Um, whether that is just me not getting good, whether that's the nature of developing those kinds of runs as a procedural thing in an open world, I'm not really sure what the, spe- what the specifics of it are, but I wasn't really having a lot of fun. It definitely lacks the curation and the, the finesse of some of the better examples of that sort of first person parkour genre, including the original Mirror's Edge, which really nailed that feeling. And on one of these procedural runs, I was smacking my head against it for a good 45 minutes. Couldn't get more than a one star. There wasn't really an alternate route because the way that it was situated on the map, you have to cross two specific bridges on the route. And it, it just takes as long as it takes. And I'd, I'd be running out of running out of time like two turns from the end and it just wasn't making any sense to me. Just got really frustrated. And it's like, I don't really want to play this right now, actually. Um, so it, it's gone on my, I've got a tab on the website called To Be Continued, which is games where it's like, I'm going to come back to it, maybe at some point, <laughs> indeterminate time in the future. And if I do, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to skip all of the procedural stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, the fragile delivery options, I believe, are curated. There's a couple of other different mission types that are curated. I'll do those and I'll finish the story again and, and that'll be me. But for now, I just want to play other stuff. And that's where that is. Um, yes, yeah, so why, don't, why don't we roll on to what we're playing? Uh, Paula, tell us about the game of the generation that is 13 Sentinels, <laughs> I guess, Rim. Because so... you actually have things to I say was... this week, I hope. I w- yep, <laughs> yeah, this too. <laughs> I swear, it, it was an innocent lie. Mm. We, were, we just tried to bait you. Yeah, and it bloody worked as well. Um. So yeah, I made some progress on 13 Sentinels last night. I think things are picking up right now. Because I'm like, mm, trying to find the name of the person. Describe them to me. Uh, The one with the two brights. Oh, um, oh, fuck, what is her name? That's Actually, embarrassing. I, I can see her in my... I can't remember. Yeah, uh... Give me a second. Is uh, this going uh, Yes. Oh, you've got the little art book as well. Nice. Yep. I got the little book. Wow. I shouldn't be surprised. I had to get hooked up. They <laughs> shafted us in Europe. They uh, they promised that it would come with the game, and then it just didn't. Hmm. Oh, and I I, uh, I emailed I emailed the the business that I bought it from. They're like, yeah, they they that's the only one that they shipped to us. I'm like, Fuck's sake, all right then. Um, anyway, Daddy. sorry, go on. Such a bummer, though. So yeah, I made progress on Tommy Kirasagi's story, and and holy shit. Hmm. Yeah. I've started to see things I wasn't like I was at that point in the game that I thought I understood like the general idea of the thing but no now I think I went like through two or her or three of her chapters and I'm like huh I don't even know what's going on anymore that's going to be a running theme of your playthrough you're going to think you've got a handle on something and then you're going to find out that you don't really yeah, because then I went and uh, continued Ogata's story. This guy's story. Yes, yeah, his is one of the better ones. Yeah. I'm confused. <laughs> That's all I be. can say to, to that. I didn't do like any battling last night because I I, um, I wanted to progress like uh, with the memories part, with the story. Mm-hmm. So battling would have to wait uh, probably until later or something like that. But um this game has my attention. Like I'll probably try to play at least a couple of hours a day if I can allow myself uh, to do so because of university. Because I really want to know what the hell is going on here. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, so yeah, that's 13 Sentinel this week. Paula is losing her mind. Paula is dissociating. Dissociating. Um, dissociating again. Thank you. Um, I made like almost your progress on Google Copolo, like one level. Uh, mm-hmm. it's still fun though. I continuing my um my adventure on Breath of the Wild on my third run, and I didn't show you guys this uh on last recording, but I actually gotta check this with all the stuff there is uh, in the game. Wow, we're, we're we're talking for those of you listening to this about twenty five pages of A four, um, with three columns of checklist. <laughs> oh, those are the trimes. The Korok seats are like oh, microscopic. It's um, like in, in three point font. You know oh. what's the worst part and about this? I thought this Rick list? had a problem like... with Vita games, but you got a whole other problem. <laughs> <laughs> let, let me read you a couple of lines of the Korok seats. Number 14, cube formation. Number 15, hiding Korok. Number 16, hiding Korok. How is this helpful? That also, explains nothing. <laughs> second off, why do you want the Koroks? It's just poo. It's just poo. <laughs> hey, I I made a point to 100% this game, and I'm doing it. All right. <laughs> Hopefully before Breath of the Wild 2. Yeah. Uh, it's still, my boyfriend got a capture card, so we're, like, streaming uh, the game to each other as we play. And we both have the DLC, so we uh, have the Heroes Path thingy so we can see like the last hundred hours of our adventure though we are like only 20 hours in and it is amazing how different our approaches are and how like how two players go like in very different directions that that's the thing with this game um but you're probably sick about this game right now so i'm moving on to a terraria cope uh, we started playing a co-op run with my boyfriend last night, and I forgot how fun this game was. Also, uh, things have changed, like the menus look different. Uh, the, me- me- the mechanics are the same, but some of the... There have been like some quality of life improvements, I don't know. Like, even the customization menu, it looks like a lot cleaner. And I really appreciated that because otherwise I would have spent like an hour trying to find the correct things for my character. And also we are like, we have like this huge mind because we were trying to get like materials and I just dig like in very, uh, very organized rows. I mean, for he's like, okay, I'm going to try to find the, uh, what's the name? Hell, the abyss? I don't know. He started like... Thinking like in the diagonal, and I'm like, no, my my clear rules. Uh, I think I'm more like your boyfriend. I'm just like, chaos is my friend. <laughs> That's what <okay>. Yeah, <laughs> there are like things in Terraria that I can be like more chaotic, with, but for some reason, like digging is like, if it isn't organized, I'm like, um, I, I don't know. My mind goes weird places. Whatever. <laughs> Moving on, I started Hakuoki SSL or Hakuoki School Life on the Vita English patch. There's more. There's more. <sighs> so oh, it's Hakuoki this Super one, Saiyan. Uh, <laughs> uh, this one is, takes place like on some. I want to say it's like an alternative universe story. Uh, so you are aren't like in the Meiji period. You aren't with the chins and gummy and stuff like that, but they pretty much took the, the already established like character personalities and made this like school setting. And for some stupid reason, the characters fit well in this setting. Like, it's like, I don't know. It's like, I, I see the character, I see them in the new setting. Oh, yeah. I can like totally see how that person got there. Like, I I I, I can buy it very much. Sorry, Hakoki is like the medieval one, right? Like ninjas and stuff. Yeah, it's a medieval gotcha. one. Uh, cool. uh, so yeah, like the first time I saw like the 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 Vita box art, and it was like a current day school, and it was like, how does this work? 
So far, it does. Uh, though it, you have to have like played the previous game because it, I think it relies on you already kind of knowing the characters because the character, uh, the the well, uh, Yuki Mura, the protagonist, uh, was transferred like a while ago to this uh, school that has just started like to. How do you say, like, accept women? That it was like an all boys school, and now the women are, are able to, to go there. So, right now, she's like the first girl in this uh, all boys school, or, or one of the few, I don't know. And the previous Hakuaki characters are either like fellow students, there's the guy in the infirmary, there's uh, one of, one of them is a teacher, I don't know how that works, but whatever. But, like, so far, I kind of like the change of pace because, like, the previous Otomes I've been playing are, like, very dark or, like, very, like, going, like, dark places and not so much fluff. But this one seems to be going full on the fluff, and I'm liking it. I did have a trouble installing the patch for some reason. Like, the first time I did it, like, it, the game wouldn't start. So, uh, so I was scared. The second time I transferred it, it didn't work. And the third time was the term, so yeah. So yeah, that's all the things I've been playing uh, in these past three days. I don't know how I fit that into my into my schedule, but... Rick, what have you been playing? Sure, so um, there's a couple that are sat on here that I haven't done much more with. Uh, those are Vagrant Story and uh, Lich and Battle Mage. Um, played a good chunk more of Uppers. But my, my thoughts haven't really changed on that. It's still just stupid fun. And the, the levels are only a few minutes long each, which is perfect because it's a great one just to pick up, bash level out, put it back down again. Um, two new games to the play versus what we talked about for the listeners last week for us three days ago. Uh, the first of those is Metal Slug Second Mission, uh, the second of the Neo Geo portable entries in the franchise. Very, very good. The first big change is that instead of the option button being to switch your fire between regular and grenades, the option button just throws grenades, which I don't know why that wasn't what they just did to start with, but it, it's a night and day difference because it, it's much less fiddling about with buttons, which is good. The only slight negative is that you can feel the influence of, of Metal Slugs 2 and 3 on it in the last few levels. And, and this is what I was talking about earlier in the episode where I said I'd almost finished. I'm literally on the last level. Um, and the the alien levels aren't nearly as obnoxiously long or drawn out as they are in the main games. But there is still a little bit of that. What I love about the game is just the variety in terms of what's there. There's like 40 levels, but like an arcade game in each individual run, depending on how you go through each level, it port you off to a different next level so as a kid i think if i'd had that in a neo geo pocket it would be amazing just to play and see what different levels you'd hit each time which is which is really cool i don't know if i'll personally be replaying it just because i've I've got the big boy metal slugs on my psp as well so it, it makes no difference for me just to go back to those but it, it's a lovely sort of demake type thing plays just as smooth as as the main entries albeit much more chunky pixels and it's real nice. And I think as well, they've just released like a a Neo Geo portable collection oh. for PC and Switch. And it's got like 10 games. There's a load of the um, a load of the fighting games got random Neo Geo pocket ports. So like, there's like a version of Street Fighter on there. There's um, the SNK Gals fighting thing. There's King of Fighters, a couple of others. But it's got both of the Metal Slug mission games. So if you're getting that or, or you'd like a, a way to get those and give SNK some money, there you go. Did you see the uh, the Metal Slug Tactics review? I did, and I am quite excited about it. Yeah. I think it could be amazing. My my concern, and this is the cynical part of my brain, because SNK Playmore have been really bad in recent years for trying to reuse all the assets they've got to make things quicker and cheaper. And my 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 thinking effectively is that Metal Gear Tactics is made to continue that because it's it's the same sprites will be in an isometric 
um, playbook. It's all the same enemies. It it, it looks like it's just a, a, a quick nostalgia player, or at least it could be. I'll be watching it because it's dot mu and, and they have a relatively good track record. So touch wood that turns out well. And if it does turn out well, uh, you better believe I'll be I'll be straight on it like a carb on it. Um, and then the the other one that I started playing. Sorry, go on. No, no, no. It was like you wanted to jump in. No, no. I was oh. just agreeing with you. Dot mu. Like they, I, I, from what I remember, they've done a lot of really good games. Um, like they did Streets of Rage Four, the new one. Yeah, no, no, no. They did the new Streets of Rage like, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Shredder's Revenge. No, they're excellent. Like especially recently. Them, yeah, yeah. They've done really good shit. Um, so I, I think. Well, I think. Yeah. I think they started just Porthouse. But yeah, they are now making their own shit, which yeah. is which is good. Um, yeah, and then speaking of lovely pixel arty stuff, the other thing I'm playing is Front Mission Gun Hazard for the SNES. So this is a, a Japan only title. I don't know why I said Japan so weird. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it, it recently got an English patch, like a fan patch. I've tried to play this game three or four times, and, and for emulation reasons, I've just struggled every single time. Uh, my PSP couldn't handle it. My Vita couldn't handle it. I tried it on something else that couldn't handle it. Anyway, on, on Friday, I, I downloaded a copy of a copy of I downloaded BSNES, which is like a SNES emulator that's focused on um, cycle accurate emulation. Runs like a dream, buttery smooth. Uh, and I'm running it through Steam so I can use my Steam controller to play it. Uh, I probably need to get a DualShock setup to do it though, because. The, the one real drawback of the Steam controller is it doesn't have a proper D-pad. So what, what I'm doing in the interim, um, forget about that, is uh, I'm, I'm, I've got WASD as the movement, and I've got the left shoulder button on left shift. And then I'm holding the controller in my right hand for like A, B, X, Y, and the right shoulder button. So I've got like a whole weird amalgam thing going on. But the game starts really excellently. Like you're in a Wanza, you're running left and right, shooting shit looks incredible bear in mind this came out in 96 mm -hmm. so like right at the very end of the snes's lifespan but it, it makes full use of that hardware looks excellent um and i'm looking forward to playing lots and lots more of it and seeing where it goes hopefully with a control with an actual d-pad which would be Seriously. which would be nice, nice. <laughs> um... uh yeah what about you, Alex? What have you been playing? Yeah, so uh, more Mass Effect 2. Haven't really touched it much, so not much more to add there. Um, I randomly started playing Where in the World is Carmen Sandiego on the SNES <laughs> last night. Because, okay, I had this, for those who don't know, Where in the World Carmen Sandiego TV show in the 90s. I think they just remade an animated version of it on Netflix. Um, they did, yeah. Yeah, apparently it's quite good. Um, and I had a copy of this game, but, but not the SNES version. I had like a computer version that I think was a bit different. Um, and as a child, I was obviously terrible at it because the whole kind of conceit with Where in the World is Carmen San Diego is that I think, I can't even remember if it was like a game show, but basically you're like going after these criminals and you have to, you have to track them down across the world. So you're given like hints about like countries and locations across the world. And then also like little hints about the person. So you have to like figure out who they are. And like the way it works is you have this like, it looks like a like a PDA or something. It's like it opens halfway, and on the left side you'll get like a screen with like images of the place that you're going, and on the right side it's kind of like a computer, and you can like click to search and like go talk to people in the locations. You can like look up, um, you can like try to request a warrant, which is like you have to figure out like what the thief looks like if they have any special indicators on them, and you can look at like the dossiers, and so you have to do that to get them, and you have uh, like a week time limit to do this. And so traveling to different countries and stuff, it's going to take up time and you got to sleep, of course. So when you're in town, they'll be like, if you're on the right track, um, they're like, oh, yeah, that person you're looking for was here. And they're off to a country that had or like they drove away in a car that had a, I don't know, like a yellow, blue and green flag, like that kind of shit. And so like, it's so funny because this came out in 92. I bet it was hard, you know, because <laughs> like. There was no easy way to look up this shit unless you had like an atlas next to you. But like nowadays with Google, I'm just like, got it. <laughs> you know, I'm like, and I know most of them too. Cause like, fortunately I know my geography pretty well, but also like, you know, again, 92. So like, for instance, Beijing is Peking still. So like some of the countries aren't updated, right? Because that's what Amazing. it was in 92, you know? Uh, oh, what's Taiwan? 
don't in that game. <laughs> I don't think it's in that game. I don't, I don't even think Taiwan's in there. <laughs> but they do have Nepal in there, and they just like they don't. It's, it's Nepal, like not part of. Uh, they don't count it as part of China, which I'm sure would piss off a lot of people these days. So, um, so many Chinese listeners. But uh, <laughs> I'm not. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. It's a weird subject. I'm burning that bridge. But yeah. Anyway. Um, but stuff like that, right? At least it's done after the Iron Curtain fell. Because if not, I would be very confused. Like, there's just a lot more countries that, although I've noticed they haven't really gone into many of those countries in this one so far. Um, Com- Commons in Germany. Which one? What? Yeah, I know, right? Yeah, they're like, what do you mean? <laughs> uh, it's a danger of playing older games, right? Where they're based on, mm. like, geography. And it also is an, it's a nice reminder of how quickly geography changes and that countries are a made-up baloney thing. Um, so... <laughs> Don't get too attached to any of them because they change within literal decades. Um, so that's my little stance against nationalism. So there you go. <laughs> um, but like, it's really fun. It's just actually quite fun. It's like a little detective game and it's it's really cute. It was made by EA uh, way back in the day. And so like, it's, it's well done. Like the mechanics work good. It's punchy. It's fun. It looks good. Um, if you have any nostalgia for it, try it out. You might enjoy it. Um, I'm also playing a game called Griftlands, which this is part of why I retired Dicey Dungeons because it's another roguelite uh, that was on sale. It just came out and uh, really, really cool so far. And it's it's roguelike in like the littlest way. Like it's, it is, but like also I'm pretty sure you could beat this game in about eight hours. Like it's not, yeah. Essentially the way it works is it's a deck builder, which I fucking love. Um, and you play as like one of three kind of like mercs and you're i'm very early on in it so i'm still learning the systems but essentially you're you play runs where like you can friend people and you can make enemies and like all your choices matter and they like affect the world around you and as you're going out you have the choice to negotiate or to fight people and those are two separate decks And your negotiation has kind of like a life bar. It's like, it's basically your like, not like stamina, but like, um, I don't know, your ability to like withhold. I I can't remember exactly what it's called, but that tracks between negotiations, just like health tracks between fights. And so sometimes you can like, you can solve encounters in many different ways. Um, And it's really, really cool. And it has like a really interesting story. Thus far, it's the most interesting story that I've seen so far. It kind of gives me Pyre vibes in some ways, like in terms of the storytelling and design a little bit. It gives me the same sort of quality feelings as that. Um, Hmm. Yeah, really cool so far. And I'm really excited to keep playing um, because I think this is one I'm definitely going to finish because it's kind of like... I think the runs are only about 30 minutes long and it's just sort of set up for you to try and finish. Um, yeah. So anyway, that's Griftlands. Just came out recently, I think. It was in early access, I believe, um, for a long time on on Steam, but it's like just officially released. Uh, I'm also playing <laughs> Namco Museum, but specifically Galaga, uh, because again, reading boss fight books and I got to their fourth one there, which is on Galaga. Uh, really cool book, actually, this one. I really dig it. He like split it up into the stages and it's sort of like, you know, a little loose and like uh, going around. And I'd never played Galaga before. And it was on sale, Namco Museum. And I was like, hmm, that's fortuitous timing. Um, and it's the arcade version, which is what I wanted. And it has Galaga and Galaga 88 in it. Um, and for those who don't know, or, you know, weren't born before, I don't know, this is in the early 80s. So none of us, but um, wow. <laughs> essentially, uh, you're a little spaceship shooting at alien insects that come down. Uh, it's like, you know, it's like an advancement on the Space Invaders idea, you know, like it was like the next step in that sort of evolution. Um, and a really fun thing, too, if you're going to play Galaga uh, in that first stage, make sure you don't shoot all the boss Galagas. Make sure you leave two insects, at least maybe one or two boss Galagas. And when they come down, they're going to try to tractor beam you up. Um, and that's a good thing. You want to get attacked by the enemy because when they tractor beam you, you'll take one of your ships. And then if you shoot that Galaga, you get double fighters. So you have two fighters along the side while you're shooting. And that makes all the difference in the world. And it has been extremely fun. It is extremely difficult. I'm not going to beat the game because it's an arcade game. You don't beat arcade games. You just get high scores. Um, But yeah, it's really fun. And you know, it's interesting to me because 
the more that I've been playing are like these old arcade games and like the boss fight books has been excellent because I get to explore all these different genres and all these different generations of games. It's the more that I'm like understanding how it's okay. It's almost insane to me that video games are lumped in as like one hobby because it's a bit like sports, right? Like we often don't say like, I'm a sports fan. You're like, well, I like soccer and I like basketball and stuff like that. But like video games have so many fucking incarnations and they are like, there's just, there's so many different types that it blows my mind. Cause I'm like, if you grew up playing these arcade games, it's just such a different world. And like it, it, talking with Keith last week too, it's like, that was his inspiration, right? And like playing Coca Cola, you're like, oh yeah, this is a different type of game. And I know for a lot of people, like, yeah, duh, games are different, Alex. But it's just like, <laughs> it's hard to sort of like frame it in my mind a little bit. And I'm trying to figure out like, what was my thing, right? And like, I'm like, what is my, and like, obviously, Game Boy games are one of them where I'm like, that's a game that I love, um, but can understand there are a lot of people who will just be like, what is this bullshit? Um, but you know, like you have like that sort of fondness <laughs> and enjoyment for it. Right. Um, so yeah, I don't know. And it makes me curious to be like, what's out right now that is going to be the thing that like really grabs people and like really uh, goes on. Um, if anything right does, I mean, while we're on the aside, I feel like mm-hmm. culturally things just have a much shorter half-life than the other did just because there's so much more churning. Um, mm-hmm. like if you think about mm-hmm. it in terms of memes, like, the troll face lived for literal years as a meme. Now yeah. format cycle from week to week to week to week. And I feel like it's the same with, uh, with games. Cause you, we, you were talking about it last week with, uh, with earthbound and undertale. And I think mm. that's exactly the same thing where earthbound was, was definitional for a good yeah. few years, but then undertale, you know, was, was in the consciousness for a few weeks. There's still some people who then followed it onto Delta Rune and everything else, but it, it's like, Oh, what's the next thing? The next thing, the next thing. And it just moves so fast. And that probably does contribute to just how different genres of games are so much more diverse than different sports or different types of films yeah. or book. Because the the way that you interface is so very different. Sports is probably the best analogy, actually. Mm-hmm. Just because um, the skill set you need for baseball is different from football, from basketball, from whatever else. And like, yeah, there, there's a certain athleticism you need. Just the same way, like, well, yeah, you're pressing fucking buttons. And even that's not necessarily true, because then you've got the Wii and VR and all the rest of it. But, well, like... Yeah. Go on. I was going to say, in playing Galaga, I'm like, I don't have this skill set. Like, I'm playing this game, and I'm like, holy shit, I'm bad at this. And then you go and look at someone playing Galaga well, and you're like, like, they're just... Oh, it's just, inc- it's incredible. They're like... And you're like... And it's it's mesmerizing in the flow yeah, state. What, like, what lab did they grow you in? Yeah, I know, right? And like, I want to <laughs> like, and it makes you want to get that. You're like, I want to play it that good. But it's like the thing I told you was like, I know I have to put in a lot of time if I want to do that. And it's the same with these like professional sports. It's just, yeah, I don't know. It's interesting. I, I'm these sort of philosophically questions always fascinate me. Hundred <laughs> yeah. percent. Now. I want to hear about Chicory because this is one that's yes. getting massive buzz. So, and I, I do quite like the look of it. It's one that I nearly and never quite got around to playing the demo of back last Steam mm-hmm. Game Fest. I'm so glad so you I'm got us curious. into the Steam Game Fest because I played the demo for this, uh, which is why I just got massive points on Fantasy Critically because <laughs> um, I picked this <laughs> game up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So thanks, Rick. This is a ah. this is what I would call one of those like generational defining games where it's like it. Yeah, it's. People aren't playing this yet, and when they do play this game, <laughs> like it's in it's an amazing game. It really is amazing. It is it's beautiful, it is incredibly creative, and it's really moving. Like the story is really deep and intense. It's um it and it, personally it hits me too, because if you if you work in art at all like you do any types of art and i'm talking like anything whatsoever artistic pursuit this game's going to really hit you because there's moments in it where like you know i met this character who to give you the basic premise you're in this world where there's these things called the wielders and the wielders have these paint brushes that they paint color into the world and so that's kind of the concept this whole world sort of revolves around painting like people are really into this and um the wielders are like the most important people in their world and it's all these like animals. They're like anthropomorphic animals. It's, it's really cute. And you are a janitor in the house of the most recent wielder. Um, and one day you wake up and the color has vanished from the world. And there are these like weird fucking like 
things that are coming up and the wielder chicory is kind of gone and so you find her paintbrush and the adventure begins um and so you go and you're painting things in but you're not very good at it and like what's really neat is that yeah this little character she's so enthusiastic actually it's never really specific if it's a he or a she so uh, they but I, I sort of see her as a the character is yeah, very yeah. enthusiastic yeah. yeah and um it's just like I don't know. She, she goes in. I'm going to refer to it as she because that's that's in my canon. It's she, um, um, meets this older wielder who talks to her about this sort of like they were a wielder for about ten years, and she's confused as to how someone would have ever retired from being one. Right? Like it's her dream to be this, and it's like the greatest thing. Like it's like you get to do this such important thing. And, you know, make art for everyone and make people happy. And, like, why would you ever want to get rid of that? And, like, it's such a subtle conversation because he has this sort of thing where he's like, well, you know, I just, you know, I was doing it for years. And I got to the point where it was just a little too much for me and I wanted to find someone. But, of course, by the time I found someone, I still had to work for a few years. So it was a little intense. And, like, he talks about how he's like, I like painting. Like, he was like, I really like painting. But it was it became my job and like he was just like you can tell this guy was just like extremely disillusioned Uh, and like uh, impressed by this right and it it deals a lot with this thing of like and even chicory at points is like you know she says like why don't you become the wielder to your character and you're like well i know you're so amazing like i love your painting and your colors they're incredible and she's like you're you're more enthusiastic like you've got the enthusiasm why don't you go ahead and this is something that like personally as an artist it's actually why i left theater like i got to that point and uh, it hit me because I had this fucking conversation with a young artist like literally like a month ago from this like I did my master's program in theater directing and I've done the directing gigs like I've you know like I've directed professionally it was awesome in a way but I also learned that like doing it as a job really and this will lead in a bit actually to our topic it it changes things you lose some of your artistry and like what I found that I really wanted to explore was the artistry of things and was this sort of experimental stuff. But if, when it becomes a job, it's different. You're relied on by a very different group of people. Um, and there are different expectations put upon you. And, um, you know, I was talking to this young guy who just got into the program from my province. And, like, you know, he was in, like, the city that I was in. And he's so excited. And it's so hard because I'm like, shit, man. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you've been there. And, like, you feel like you're the jaded guy. But it's like there are realities that I know, right? And I also don't want to dissuade this person, but I also kind of feel like I know what's going to happen. You know what I mean? And it's, it's just, it's hard. Cause I'm like, I don't know. The best I can do is like warn a little bit about what it's like. And then also just be like, listen, you have to go on this journey yourself and figure it out. Yeah. For yourself. You have to let people have that experience. You can't tell them with so many right. things like that. Cause they'll never figure it out. And then playing this game, I'm like, fuck. I'm like, you know, you're playing as that enthusiastic person, as that unjaded, as that individual who has so much enthusiasm and wants to do so much, but really is doing too much. Right. And you can't do everything, you know, and you can't please everyone and you can't, um, and if, and if you make your art your your life, it's no longer yours. And so that's something that I think is really interesting. And it's a really deep thematic element that I didn't expect from the anthropomorphic coloring book game. I <laughs> just, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I was like, fuck! Like, I'm playing this and I like, had a moment where I was like, <laughs> oh no. Like, and it, and it does it so subtly. Like, it's not in your face, right? Like, it's just so well written. It's just beautiful. And like, all the characters are fucking hilarious and they're incredibly well written. And it's a game where I want to like actually see all the dialogue because I'm like, <laughs> oh, this is cute. And every page you can go and color things in. And it's funny, I'm actually playing part of it with my like X Pen tablet because sometimes there are, I actually think you could play this entire game with a tablet and your keyboard because a lot of it's drawing. And so sometimes there's drawing segments. And so I just plug my tablet in and I do the drawing with that um, because I don't really like drawing with the mouse. And it's really fun. So it's really neat. It's also on the PlayStation 5 and 4, but I think you should probably play this on the PC because it's like a drawing game. So how, mm-hmm. how is it mechanically? Is the, the gameplay a lot of drawing? Because what, what I'm hearing sort of narratively, I'm very interested in, but I'm also, 
Like I have no visual artistry, music, no, and whatever. No, you need I can none do. of that. I you need none of that okay. shit. You don't need any of that. Okay. It's not. That's not how it works. So there are drawing segments, and those segments are pretty much entirely optional. This game simplifies things in such a great way, and it it actually it encourages you. It's like you don't think you're good, try, and you, and then it's like. Oh, here, we can make you a little bit better. Why don't you try that again? But the drawing, like specific drawing segments are actually optional. Really what it is, is that your mouse is your brush. And so the puzzles are more like, for instance, one of the things that you ha- you can do is you can paint on the ground and then you can press shift and you can like splatoon into the paint and go into like special like uh, corridors and stuff. And then there's also things like there are different objects where if you paint over them, they'll like appear and they'll open up and they'll let you do this stuff. Oh, and the puzzles are so smart. Oh, they're so smart. They're like, I have had multiple aha moments in this game. Like so many of them that felt super good. And when you get it, like I was like, what am I supposed to do? And then I was like, I got it. <laughs> you know, and like you feel, and, the, and it feels like the game's going, yeah, good job, buddy. Like, you know what I mean? Like the game doesn't feel like mean in its puzzles. It feels like they're like, nice, good job. Like we don't want to give you too much, but we want to give you a bit. And once you figure it out, ooh, you're going to have some fun. And it's very Zelda. Like it's like a Zelda game, but there's no combat. It's just with your a uh, little 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 brush and you do lots of different stuff and you get lots of new abilities for your brush um you also get like you know you'll get things like jumping and stuff like that throughout um so that's kind of the the gameplay the gameplay is based around your brush um but you don't have to like draw things it's not like okami right like that's the only other thing i could think of that has a brush it's not like that where it was like where you draw symbols and stuff nah um but every screen is blank so you can paint in everything with and they give you different colors on different screens um, so you're just filling it. It's basically paint by numbers in terms of the gameplay of it for the most part. Am I understanding that correctly? No, you're not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, that's the optional part. You can paint in the background optionally, but you're going on a quest. So you have to, you have to do something. And so painting in the backgrounds is optional. Um, you could literally play through this game and not paint in the backgrounds at all if you wanted to. You don't have to. Um, but it's tantalizing and they want you and they, they offer it for you. Uh, but you're going and talking to people and you're going through dungeons. So there's lots of different dungeons and the dungeons uh, use the painting mechanics in order to play it. Like I would be spoiling it if I told you exactly how it works because the wonder right. of it okay, is okay, beautiful okay. and uh-huh. I don't, you shouldn't, you should play it. Like this is what I'm saying. Like it's one of the games where I'm like everyone can play this game and you should play it. Because, and also any computer can fucking run this game like their steam requirements are pretty funny like sound card it says yeah good idea um like things like where it's just like <laughs> like it's like stuff like this go, go look at the out. steam requirements they're pretty funny something was like toaster or higher for like graphics card or something like that um or like graphics card <laughs> just said recommended like if something like that right, where it's, it's, yeah it says sound card absolutely yes so what you're talking about is minimum it has like yeah. bits about that so like graphics pretty good uh, additional <laughs> notes this game is hacking good and then under recommended <laughs> recommended processor it says we strongly recommend you use a computer rather than a toaster <laughs> beautiful exactly it'll beautiful. basically work on anything it's not it's not heavy duty it's like a gig right it's a small game um but it's beautiful it's probably small because it's all black and white and then you put colors on it so like the file size isn't that big um yeah anyway i've talked on i'm going to talk about this game a lot over the next few weeks i think um, because I think this is one of those games that everyone should should really check out um, because it is just, it's one of those rare games. It's like, you know, like a short hike. It's that feeling. I got that feeling again where I'm like, this is fucking good. And I'm like, this mm. is, this is fucking good. <laughs> you know, you're like, everybody play it. <laughs> uh, you're doing a good job. I'm, I'm mulling it over. Nice. And it's cheap, like 20 bucks. I was like fucking in. <laughs> um all right. Anyway, that's that's the games. Whoa, we went on and on because um, we like lost surprisingly. How is it that three days later we have so many new games? <laughs> but anyway, I don't know. I know we love games <laughs> here. Uh, let's move on to the topic of the week, which I actually think chicory was a nice way to go into this because this is kind of what got me thinking about this a little bit. Um, I wanted to talk about craftsmanship and artistry in video games and sort of the spectrum of these two things because this is something that I, I realized as and like, I'll give like an example of what craftsmanship and artistry are. And, you know, as an actor, like when I was working as an actor, um, theater schools and stuff, they always sell you on the idea that you're an artist, right? That like you're going to go and you're going to create art um, and you're going to like expand the boundaries of art and stuff like that. When really what they don't tell you is they're training you to become a craftsman, which is fine. And like a craftsman is essentially someone who perfects their craft through the pursuit of the process, 
right? It's like the nuts and bolts. It's like um, it's like someone who becomes extremely proficient at making knives, right? They are masters at it. They know exactly how it works and they know everything about that and they make those knives the exact same way or in similar ways um, and they're, they're, they're perfect at it. Now, a craftsman can create beautiful art. They're not mutually exclusive, right? And an artist can have incredible craftsmanship, right? They can, they can have an incredible process. Um, but I do think they're kind, of, they're kind of on a spectrum and they're like you know, two sides to it. And actors are often craftsmen in the sense that they're shoved into a show that's terrible and they don't like it, but they have to do their work and they've got their process and they do their thing. And no one really tells you that in team school that like, listen, you're probably going to do a lot of shitty soap operas for the rest of your life. <laughs> Here you go. Um, and in games, I think it's fascinating because I think of artistry as something that pushes the boundaries of the medium you work in through experimentation and, and usually failure. And like, let's be clear, games are art. Like, I'm not here to have that conversation. But within it, there's differences, right? And so, and, and often artistry leads to failure, right? Like a lot of times artistry fails and it has to because it's, it's about experimenting and it's about um, figuring out you know, the boundaries of something. Occasionally, artistry creates something really impressive. Like Chicory, to me, is a real good example of artistry because it's taking a lot of fascinating ideas and it's experimenting with them. Paula, can you tell us a little bit about what, what you described? Because I thought you had a really good description for craftsmanship as well. Yeah, for, craft, for craftsmanship, I said something like, okay, we going to take this that works and perfect it. This made me think of iterative series or games that focus on that mechanic that works and perfect it. The like when you talk about how Spyro was a perfected collect collectathon. Perfectathon. Yeah. Uh perfectathon. As for the artist concept is I I just have this idea and you just roll with it. Yeah. I like, and the example that came to my immediately was Cuphead. Yes, Cuphead. That's a really nice example where it really pushes kind of the boundaries of like of the sh of the shmup in a lot of ways, right? Um mm -hmm. Uh, while really changing things up. And I, I think of Death Stranding as a really good example of artistry because it really experiments, right? It takes an idea and it really experiments it. Connectivity, right? Within like almost, not necessarily synchronous, but almost asynchronous connectivity um, with with other characters and like building a world together. And look, you can hate it and that's totally fine. Like artistry, um, and even something like Last of Us Part Two, to me, that is a game that really very much has, is is artistry in motion there right because arguably um what it does what it sets out to do narratively as a video game is extremely different from what we have in any other video games does it nail it in 100 no but that's kind of the point right when it comes to artistry because i would actually argue that like craftsmanship wise their like gun combat has never been amazing <laughs> so like um... but then then also do they change really much of anything in terms of how they tell that story no, oh, hugely. Because There's no video game that's told a story like that. And I know that we maybe have seen it in other mediums, but this is what's important. Artistry is about your medium. And so sometimes it fails and it tries to adapt things from other mediums into it. I see this in theater a lot. People will try to adapt something from an outside medium into their medium um, and try to you, and try to create it within the medium that they have. Um, but like I, I can't think of a single video game that has a story like or has a narrative um, technique like The Last of Us Part Two. Um, it's just so, it, it is quite unique and it, it does kind of push the boundaries. And also in terms of the way that the accessibility that comes into it as well, like I think they're really pushing the boundaries of like how a game can be accessed. Yeah, I mean, I, all of this is coming from someone who's not played the game, who's very okay. <laughs> happy to think of The Last of Us as a self-contained bubble. But what yeah. from what I do know of the game, like accessibility, I'll go with you. They've, they've clearly mm -hmm. made great strides in, in making those options available and showing the the um benefit of those options and and, and implementing them and, and whatever else narratively i don't know that that it particularly did push all that much either in terms of the mechanics of how it was said me you haven't played maybe though, so... i'll give you a little <laughs> bit in terms of what they say so i i know how yeah. the story goes i ended okay. up being interested in those leaks and sort of reading the summary that, that turned out to be more or less accurate to what it was Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say that it does like I because I know and like I'm talking about especially too of like how it's presented and just e even in its structure, 
its structure is quite unique. I, I, I just honestly, I haven't seen a video game that does this structure like this. You can you can argue like some of the narrative beats of like you know killing a big character or something, but even that, honestly, like I was like as I was playing it, I was just like, I might you might not love all these beats, but I'm like these are different, and like the way that they're getting me to play this, this is different, and taken as separate pieces, I think you're totally right. As separate pieces, games have done some of these things before, right? Um, and when you take them in isolation, but I think when you combine these things together into the package that they put them into is when you get the artistry and it's when you get the experimentation. And I think there are some important lessons to learn. Like, I still think video games are a, a kind of an immature storytelling medium. It just, they haven't quite, we haven't quite hit the stride yet. There are some great, um, examples that are like pushing those boundaries, but like as a medium in general, if you're looking for like deep probing looks at humanity, we're not there yet, <laughs> but we're going to get there. And it's you happened. haven't played 13 Sentinels Argus Rim yet. But. but dude, the exceptions prove the rule. You know what I'm saying? Like there's <laughs> only a couple games that kind of do these things, right? And even a game like 13 Sentinels, which to me sounds like it actually goes on the artistry side of things where it's trying to push what is like a visual novel. And uh, But maybe I don't I don't know if that's totally, I don't know. What do you think? Structurally, I, I, I wouldn't definitely call it think. a visual novel at all. I, it, it's more like an adventure game. Like the the yeah. The narrative is, lin- well, it's static in that that you have one singular sort of end point. Um, I'd say in, in terms of the way it's set up, that how you get there is ordered completely differently for every person. Although that doesn't change the narrative, it changes your perception of it because you get different beats and revelations at different points. Um, in terms of what you're talking about for, for artistry, 100%. Yeah. Uh, even, even in terms of combat, a little bit. But I... <laughs> There's something else I was going to say. I, I lost the thread slightly there, I think. Well, you think about um, it. What you're mentioning to me sounds like really like this is an example of they're taking these ideas that maybe even ideas that have existed before, but they're really trying to push it to its extremes, right? Like, But I, I suppose this is where where maybe your definition is rubbing up against my experience because when you talk about artistry, what I'm thinking is things that have never been done before. And you talk about it being of the medium. One of the special things about 13 Sentinels is not only is it something that's novel for video games, the way it's set up and plays out is something that could only be done in video games. It, mm-hmm. it, it's truly novel in that sense. It's not like yeah. something where you might say, oh, well, they've pulled this from movies, they've pulled this from books. This is a new thing, and then they've wrapped it all in a bow. It's like this is all completely unique to this game everywhere. Yeah, and I think that, but that's artistry, right? Like, you don't have to pull from other things for artistry to exist. But also something to remember, too. um, I think we have to be careful when we think of the idea of something completely novel because that's just not how artistry works, right? Like, yeah, you can never make something totally new. Nothing is truly new. (laughs) Yeah. This is truly new. I I, I accept that, but I also also think that that it's still the case. Um, And then to me, actually, I would argue then, like what you're saying, that 13 Sentinels is is like one of those examples that are like really far on the artistry side of things, like in terms of thinking of it as a spectrum. It's like- If you're calling it a line graph, yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah. Then that's Mm -hmm. how I like to think of these things. Like I don't like to think of it like there's art, you know, artistic games and then there are craftsman games because that- is sort of you know what i mean it's like a a zero sum kind of thing it's like they're on a line right and like some games like for instance outriders when i played that game that is not an artistic game (laughs) um (laughs) it's very much trying to be craftsmanship where it's like that it wasn't really a new idea they kind of took like hey you know that gameplay in mass effect and like gears of war and stuff why don't we just do that (laughs) you know what i mean like so i suppose it makes more sense than in that in that sense to think of it as a uh, like a there's a specific term for it but the, the four quadrant graph where it's like oh, yeah one axis is artistry and one axis is craftsmanship um that's a great idea yeah in, in mm-hmm. fact now that now that i think of it that way um there's a there's a website called digitally downloaded and their review scores they accompany with a graph like that and they use wow. different terminology but i actually think it, it may be entirely what you're talking about that's cool i like that please send the, it my way. The, the guy behind that website is like super about um treating sort of games seriously as an artistic medium and mm-hmm. and all of that good stuff he he actually gave ghost of tsushima a six out of ten because he felt like it was inauthentic to the to the setting that it was aiming for mm-hmm. um and that that was a big thing behind the way that that he looked at that game um it, it really good stuff i mean anyone who's listening if, if you're like invested mm-hmm. enough 
to um to be listening to a gaming podcast for two hours every week like this, this is the kind of content you will probably find something in yeah so he he has a an innovative classical gaming in terms of like mm. the novelty of the mechanics and he has a thoughtful entertaining in terms of how much the narrative is it's not quite the same as what you're talking about but in terms of the way that graph set up, it's the same kind of thing. Yeah, that's kind of in the in the realm of what I. Yeah, it's kind of in that realm too, though. When I think about it, I think mine's is like maybe a more simplified even version of what he's discussing, because um, that's like a, I think an even more thought out version. But I think it's really useful to think of games in some of these ways, right? Like, and and it also can help temper your expectations in some ways. Like when I enter into a game where I I understand that the game is going for artistry, I find that I'm a, I'm able to forgive some things a little bit more because I know of the experimental sort of nature of it. And then when I enter into a game where it's like specifically, I know that it's mostly just craftsmanship and like they're just trying to really nail this experience. I'm like, well, if you don't nail it, what the fuck are you doing? You know, like, uh, <laughs> the, uh, yeah. Like that's where my complaints well, be it, then that can be ways. That can be, again, reductive in the same way that you're talking about, because then if mm-hmm. you're saying, well, if you're if you're aiming to be a, be a craftsman and nail it, I'm not even thinking about the artistry. I'm just expecting you to nail the craftsman aspect of it. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. that, that, uh, no, I mean, yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, because sometimes I have to be a little reductionist in what I'm playing, you know what I mean, like, um, and that's more when I'm thinking about what I want to play, like, Outriders was an example where I was like, I got a little annoyed, because I went, you fuckers are trying to just make a good, like, fucking over-the-shoulder, sh- like, shooter game, and you can't nail the fucking, like, um, cover shooting mechanics, what the fuck, <laughs> like, I'm like, yeah, that's you got nothing fair. else that's going fair. for you, man. Like, <laughs> fucking nail it. Like, you know. Uh, and I suppose that's interesting in, in that it also, in a weird way, and this this is definitely not where you're aiming for this conversation to go, but uh, it almost bleeds into the whole like politics and video games thing, like that old chestnut, mm. where or at least in, in the way that you've described it to me, that's how it's clicking in my head because there's merit to the idea that like no game can completely disregard mm-hmm. its place in the world and. The fact is that politics touches on everything in the world in, yeah. in some form or another. But equally, yeah. there is a space for a pure, if you want to call it a craftsman from a mechanical standpoint, experience where, like, yeah, sure, you could you could talk about, like, the politics of space invaders. But also, I just want to shoot some aliens. <laughs> yeah. And that like, also it, depends on how you set your game, right? Like, I always mm-hmm. think games like you know like like the far cry thing happened last week but it was a little more complicated but like if you set your game in a fictional world that resembles that of a world of guerrilla fighters motherfucker you better make an artistic statement you know what i mean i'm like because you've made a political choice you know it's like already now if you set your game in outer space 500 years into the future with a cyber cyborg space alien okay your politics are kind of out of the question now. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? It's like, you can ignore it, right? Halo, look, I get a little weird when I'm like, hmm, this is like a weird space military fantasy, but also it's fake, so whatever. You know what I mean? Like, it doesn't have, like, present-day analogies, I guess, and that's where I think, this is getting a little bit off into different stuff, but you know what I mean? Like, I think that's actually an example where it's like, if you're going to make a political choice inherently in your story that you're telling, at least go for it. You know what I mean? Go for it. That was my, some of my complaints with Far Cry 5, where I was like, bruh, just go for it. Yeah. <laughs> let's roll with that, though, then. Because if, mm-hmm. let's say you are uh, not a French developer, not developing a game. Let, let's say you want to make a game with, like, present-day um, aesthetics, mechanics, weapons, everything else. Mm-hmm. But you want to focus on the craftsmanship of that. How do you reconcile those two? Because what you're saying is, is set it in space, and then I don't care. But like, what if that's the aesthetic you're looking for sans political context? How do you square that circle, do you think? I think you have to, um, well, actually, you see studios like Greedfall doing it where, or like with Greedfall, right? Like they've set it into an aesthetic of colonialism, but actually they do try to tackle it and they do a pretty good job. You know, but this is, this is the question that artists have to ask themselves. And I actually think that if you are so desirous of creating an aesthetic that has political ramifications for individuals, I think you really have to ask yourself some serious and tough questions about why you want to do that. And I also think you have a responsibility if you do choose that. And is that fair? I don't know, but I just think that's the reality, right? Like, it's like, if I'm like, man, I really like the, you know, People's Revolution era in China or some shit, right? Like, I mean, I can't just set it there, you know? Like, maybe it makes sense for my game, but like, 
I have a responsibility if I try to do that. And I think, I don't know. I just think that, especially when you're making a game, okay, this is going to give capitalism everything. This is going to get way off into stuff. But like, if you're making a uh, game, <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like we I, work, mean, I had a thought to bring it back if you do want to yeah. pull yourself back from the edge. No, it's okay. Because it's, it's not really the edge, but this is an entire <laughs> thing. We can pull it back after, but it's just like, but this is also comes from my personal beliefs on creating art, where it's like, if you're making art for commodity sake, right? Which most video games these days, they are. It's so political in all senses. Like I just saw Ubisoft making um, indigenous um, like operatives for um, their Rainbow Six sort of thing. And I'm like, the chances you guys consulted and did that and are going to do this right is so small. (laughs) And like, when I think about it, I go, why are you making this? They want people to buy these characters. And so I'm like, who are you aiming this at? And so I don't know, it always feels a little gross to me. Um, when people make these like cultural decisions and like same, even with far cry six, it feels a little off to me, you know, but I'm going to wait until they make it and like, see what the, how they do with it. Um, but I feel like they dropped the ball with five because they want to make these games that are political. But the question is, what are they grabbing from this, from the politics of it? Like even with far cry six, I'm like, they talk about how they talked to gorillas, the gorillas, and that they really loved the fact, like they loved their stories and they fell in love with their stories. And I was like, what parts of their stories did you fall in love with? Was it the like fucking combat fighting bullshit? And I'm like, that's really weird. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, it, I don't know. Mm-hmm. We're And we're entering into that world where I'm like, now like artistry is vanishing and they're just like craftsmen who want to make these really fun open world games but they've decided to do them in like the most politically charged places on the planet every time and it's like jesus christ guys like your games are really fun but the ones that i actually liked the most was like far cry primal because you know what there is no politics in that one (laughs) like you know what i mean i can there's no politics analogous to the ones of the world that we live in. Let's put it that exactly, way. Like, exactly. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Because when I was asking the question, effectively, what I was thinking about, just to, to pull this back, yeah. uh, it was the Valkyria Chronicles series, mm. which is mechanically very artistic because that whole turn-based real-time amalgam that they do. Um, other games have copied since. I think of Codename Steam and a couple of others, but very much originated with that series. But then also in terms of the story, it's set in an alternate universe, World War II. But even doing it that way, they have like their, they call them the Darksons, but it's the equivalent of the the Jews in their their history. So they don't even really avoid it. They they just do the same thing in a slightly different place. And I I suppose when you talk about the, the craftsmanship of art, we love the idea of this combat in this kind of setting in this place. I wonder... And maybe this is a whole conversation for another time. The other, the other conversation for another time I thought of was um, if you if you talk about that on a macro level, artistry craftsmanship. Mm-hmm. How does that work on a micro level in a studio of hundreds and thousands of people? How mm-hmm. how do you how do you frame that as an individual and then as a as a team within that big group and then as a studio? But I, I suppose what I'm thinking is if I'm a developer and I want to make a from a mechanical standpoint a, a a craftsman's game i want to make a a honed experience how do i do that in the setting that i think fits the craft that i want to do without addressing that politic and i I suppose what i'm getting from your perspective is you you can't tough shit yes i I wonder if (laughs) i i I feel like and this isn't something i've thought about at any great depth but i feel like there must be a way somehow there must be and again but i think things like halo are kind of an example right like you don't have to think about it too much um the thing is that if look for instance if you're back here halo primal coming to stores christmas 2020 yeah right but if master chief of the carbine there you go right if you want to introduce things like like racism and and you know like heavy themes like sexism and like all of this and like systemic oppression and stuff if if you want to put these in your game which a lot of these games do they give back killer chronicles with the darks and stuff which i don't even really think they do a great job with that like it's kind of the like vanilla like oh but we're friends now on the team that kind of thing it's very anime yeah. and i feel like you do you do have to <laughs> almost forget about the setting a little bit and, and yeah. just sort of park that Which, i mean I, i've only played two so far and the story in that is so twee it's actually quite easy to yes to sort of park it and but. that's why it's it's with games like that it's it's a little bit easier to ignore it and it's also a little bit easier to just forgive it because you're like well i'm not talking about the real world it's fucking fantasy um but at the same time fantasy and this is why i think i get frustrated because fantasy 
science fiction, all these things can be incredible conduits to look at our world. But they also don't have to be, right? They don't have to. They can they can just be their own thing. But again, when you set it in our lived world, I just think you have to deal with the politics. And I don't know, I would prefer that studios try, genuinely try to approach these topics instead of just abandoning them. Uh, and look, I know in today's world, sadly, sometimes when you try that, it's it's met with just like fierce. But even then, I don't think it's as bad as it actually seems. People will still buy the goddamn games. So I, I just kind of think like if you try it genuinely, you might fuck up. But like that's part of being an artist is like attempting these things, fucking them up, learning from it and moving on and like trying to make better work afterwards. But I don't know. This is a whole other conversation. Paula, do you have any thoughts? Because like Rick and I just going off and off. I'm here. I'm just here in my little corner because I didn't know like what to say or when to talk <laughs> when the conversation shifted right there. Like I've been trying to think like of examples mm-hmm. and the Liar Princess and the Blind Prince, uh, particularly is like mm-hmm. very very artistic. Mm-hmm. So some of I don't want to say like the gameplay or the mechanics are like well thought out because they are, but mm-hmm. Um, there are like little things that that could have been like better in a way if they went like more traditionally, mm-hmm. but they took the step to keep like the whole aesthetic and theme of the game, mm-hmm. uh, which I still really appreciated. Though I was thinking like on interactive franchise, franchise, franchises, yeah, on interactive franchises, there can still be like that one or two games that go full artistry. Mm. Like, I was thinking particularly on Majora's Mask on that regard mm. because of how different is from the formula, like the games prior to it were trying to establish, like, um, a link to the past, um, over enough time, you get like three things to get, like, the Master Sword, and then you uh, do temples, and then you save the world. Well, and it is very linear in a way. Well, on Majora's Mask, you have the three-day cycle. Mm-hmm. And the way you interact with the world is uh, quite different because you also have, like, the transformation mask. And people, um, well, not all of them, but there there are people that will uh, interact a little different with you, depending on mm. if you look like a Korok or a Sora or a Goron. So, though I think they could have gone a little bit further, but given that the game had a one-year development cycle, <laughs> yeah. it's still impressive. Well, and I think what you're touching on, too, is something that I think Nintendo does really well, where they they constantly are pushing the bounds of artistry, right? But the fact is that sometimes good craftsmanship can allow you to push that boundary, right? If you have perfected yeah. your process, which I think a lot of their companies have, like Breath of the Wild, I would think of as an example of artistry where it's like, they took an idea and they went like, let's fucking go, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. <laughs> and then they have a strong a strong ability, right? So like, if you were thinking of it more in that quadrant, like Rick was thinking about, that's where I'd be like, that's like craftsman and artistry, like two to max, right? Where it's like, um, well created and um, pushing the boundaries or like pushing the, the, the kind of like, realms of games right i, I think of mm-hmm. lots of nintendo games that do that you know um and then sometimes they just put yeah. out a game that's just really well made <laughs> mm, and that's... So i was thinking on a discussion that was taking place the other day i think it was in a zelda video or something like that mm-hmm. where some of the games have like this one really good me- mechanic that defines how the game is played mm. and then never comes back mm. and on one hand it keeps things fresh but in the other hand it's like imagine this same mechanic more polished mm. and just taking advantage of like to help him back um it's like galaxy some of one the and mechanics two. Of this, yeah yeah like galaxy one and two or for example i was uh, i tried to think like what was the one mechanic they said like bring it back but better but i can't remember oh, it wasn't yoshi oh. was it no, because he used to exclusive. Hmm. I don't know. Mm. Rick, what were you going to say? Sorry, my, my mind went black. Okay. Cool. Well, I, all I was going to say, is, I think the more we talk about it, the more I think 
the conversation is really artistry craftsmanship is just like is the game good or not (laughs) (laughs) honestly in some ways yeah um but then it also depends on the artist level right like are they aiming to create just like a perfection of systems but um i i think you're totally on the ball there (laughs) here's maybe another interesting inflection point and i'm it's on my mind because it's one i'm debating whether to buy while it's currently on sale by the time you listen to this at home or at work or on you know wherever you're (laughs) fucking listening to this um pathologic Mm. oh yes so that is very much (laughs) are you familiar with this game paula pathologic i will send you a link to the steam page Mm -hmm. it the the developers describe the game as um intentionally being quote almost unbearable Mm -hmm. so you you are um a doctor um in the first game of, of one of three different types in the second game of one type um who has gone to this weird ass town to try and cure a plague you have 12 days um it's a bit like a survival game in that you have to keep feeding yourself you have various bars to handle uh, but the plague is a very real threat your reputation plays a significant role in the story um but there's a lot of systems that move you around it's supposed to be uncomfortable it's not necessarily aimed to be fun yeah it's one of those games where it's trying to make you feel things but not necessarily to give you a good game mm-hmm. but in a very intentional way that almost bypasses like my gag reflex for that kind of shitty game good story thing because it there's a very specific intent about it and it, it it's sort of a ludonarrative narrative congruence thing yeah. H um, bomber guy did a great video on it and that's how i got turned on to it because yeah. uh he he did a video about vaccines that popped up in my recommended feed that was quite interesting. And then from that, I I can't remember if they had autoplay on or if it was just like I was stuck for things to do and clicked on the on the pathologic one and ended up watching a few other creators' videos on it after that and thought, I think I'd hate to play this, but I kind of want to. Yeah. <laughs> I hear pathologic two is like a little more bearable, but like it's it's kind of like a remix of the first one in some ways. Yeah, so pathologic two, and this is completely off topic this is potentially something where the the publisher tiny build have um stuck their cheeto fingers into the marketing of it and sort of ruined it a little bit Mm. so what what happened is pathologic the original got a classic hd remaster Mm. which is currently a pound which is why i'm thinking about buying it because at that price it's you kind of it'd be rude not to (laughs) yeah i I just saw the price yeah yeah it's like 90 percent off at the moment pathologic 2 when they were developing it they so they, there's three different characters that are playable yeah. in the original Pathologic. There's um, there's two, and then there's a changeling that gets unlocked once you've beaten one of their campaigns. Pathologic 2 focuses on the second of the three, and supposedly they were planning to sort of bring DLC out to add the other campaigns in, but they've had financial difficulties. COVID's hit them hard. I think the, the developer had to lay off some people, so it's a whole, yeah. a whole thing. Yeah, but Pathologic 2 in and of itself is content complete, um, and there's like a DLC that adds a bit of... Um, the bachelor's campaign back in it's like one day of his campaign or something but but that that's a game where artistry is clearly the focus yeah and maybe like you say less so with the sequel but with um with the original certainly craftsmanship uh to a large degree and and to some extent almost intentionally goes out of the window and then I, i suppose that's another question that bounces off it which is when it comes to craftsmanship does good mean fun or does mm-hmm. good mean congruent with with the developer's aims or the artistry or, or the everything else? Oh yeah, we can, there's so many places you can go with this stuff. <laughs> yeah, I, see, I feel like sorry, go on. No, you see what I mean though, right? With this, like this is why I kind of want to talk about this because I think it's a really useful thing for game developers to think of too when they're going into it, and artists in general to think of like what is your goal with this, right? And like what are you entering into uh, in this kind of I don't know. And then also when you're playing games, think to yourself like what do you think they were doing with this? And I, I think it can give you a nice enjoyment and like extra analysis on games as you're going through it. And I, I suppose I get where you're coming from in the sense that um, how the medium's treated an advancement of the same involves maybe some consideration of those differences. The same way that uh, Parasite's view differently to an MCU film mm. or the same way that like... Um, uh, what's his name? The the author that writes the crime books, and they're all like the same, and they sell gangbusters. Robert Ludlum. Nope. No. Um. Ah. Uh, oh no. Yeah, you know what I mean. <laughs> no. <laughs> but like, 
yeah. <laughs> one of those versus like a really really sort of out there um thematic book yeah. like the, there are there are different levels that you might want to engage with generally or like on a on a case by case basis mm-hmm. and video games more than any other medium i think are, are really powerful in their ability to do that because you're an active participant and that that's no truer than pathologic because you you actually have to think you know it's it's not like oh robert was hungry but he had no money like you are actively in that situation weighing those options up and making those decisions exactly um but that also maybe this is an interesting way to round it off Mm -hmm. is one of the drawbacks because you can't Mm -hmm. code all of those eventualities Mm -hmm. and there's there's a pain in that you can get close in a way that you can't with a book where you've already fucking written the thing. And it's hard. You know, he, oh, yeah. I was going to say, it's harder I, in a game to convince someone to go sit through a bad experience than it is in a book or a movie. You can watch terrible characters in books and movies a bit easier sometimes than you can in the game. Because like you say with Pathologic. Because you have that separation. Yeah. Yeah, right? Yeah. Paula, do you have any last thoughts you want to round us out on? With? The thing with beta games is, and we actually touch on that, like when I'm talking about Psychedelica, is how you want the player to see the story versus how the player actually sees the story. Yeah, you see some um, control in terms of the directorial side of things, even with like a walking sim. Yeah. As a developer, you still have power like on the pacing and things like that. But I feel like in video games, the rhythm on which you're being hit with a message is different from books and movies. Because in the movie, the you have this scene like carefully crafted so... The, the right notes will hit at the right part of the conversation to like mm-hmm. make this composition of a scene and make like all the feelings like be more intense or something like that mm-hmm. or hit more intensely. Well, in games, the way you have to, if you're not in a cutscene uh, anyway, if they're like the mechanics have to be like very in touch with your story or with your world. Or you have to go like full in your I don't know because yeah. And then are you even a game? <laughs> difficult it is to get that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like I adore like visual novels and stuff like that. And I do appreciate like the amount of choices in you can make in some of those, but the reality is that a writing in a mutual novel has more po- more power than a writer, let's say, for an open world game. That is like the comp- complete opposite because as in a visual novel, at least you know the player is going to see like, I don't know, a fifth of the dialogue at the release if they're doing like a route. Mm-hmm. Or in the Stainsky's place, I think you can see like 70% of the dialogue in your first run. But in the case of games where a lot of the stuff that is put in is optional. It's like a then... Mass Effect. I'll never see all the dialogue in Mass yeah. Effect. <laughs> Then, then as a developer, like you, how how you put that inf- extra information in, and how do you make the player want to see that? Like, there's this balancing act between like wanting the player like to gain curiosity by themselves, which is I think more valuable, versus almost carrying the player by the hand until uh, to the side missions so they actually find it. And if you want to do that, should you really be making a game? Yeah. Uh, that, yeah. Well, so let's... Okay. That's why I was thinking uh, how 13 Sentinels is based. Like, I'm on the same camp with you that th- this is a game that couldn't exist in any other medium. Because with visual novels, you have the equivalent that is like just your own adventure books. But here, since the narrative is like this bundle of threads intertwi- that are constantly intertwining with each other and then like falling apart and then like, coming together again. Uh, yeah. Things like that are the the things that I feel games can do and no other medium can do. And even beyond the narrative, the adventure scenarios of the uh, the mm. memories of 13 Sentinels, some of the narrative is tied up in the combat as well, particularly yeah. in, later, in later scenarios. So it's not like um, you could even just put it in a book or anything like that, which you couldn't anyway, but that's I feel like that's worth mentioning as well. Uh, we have run and run and yeah, run. Yeah, I was just about to move us along. <laughs> that's our... Uh... Yeah, we that was I don't know. I'm I'm happy with that. That was a great conversation. We touched on yeah, a lot could, of stuff there. 
uh, about gaming and whatnot, let us know your thoughts. But I think, sadly, we're going to have to skip the question this week. <laughs> oh, sorry. We'll get to them <laughs> soon, I promise. If you have questions for us, you can send them to howlongtobepodcast at gmail.com or go to the website. Find us on How Long To Be. <laughs> or we even, we actually while you're smashing that like Google's. button, pop them in the comments down below. Oh, yeah, YouTube, what, what? Or Discord, anywhere. Why don't we get to everybody's favorite game? How long to beat the game? Let's see, what are we playing with this week? What games has Alex been researching this week? Yeah, no research for me this week. <laughs> Though I think Paula might do good on this one. Ooh. Oh no. Rick, you might oh, do good yes, too. I don't know. Pokemon Emerald. <laughs> <laughs> Holy fucking shit, no. Why are you all the Pokemon I'm going to be real with you here. Like, I don't think I can even guess the completion one because that's going to be fucking nuts. Like, there's no way it's mm. a normal amount of time, right? Like, because, you know, Pokemon players totally don't play their games for a long time. Especially yeah. because of Emerald having all the extra stuff, like the radius, the battle with the puzzles. The final frontier, the fucking battle frontier. If it were Ruby and Sapphire, it would be easier. Mm hmm. Well, here's, here's what I've done I've put down the times that were logged for Soul Silver. I'm going to think that they're close to accurate. <laughs> I so am that's suffering. 28 hours main. That's 33 <sighs> hours main plus. The 100% would never be never be the same. So fuck that. I'll go for the three hour spread. Yeah. Fingers crossed. I feel like 100% is like, it's easily in the 100. I feel like it's so Maybe, yeah. high up there. I just don't think I could guess within the proper range, even like a little bit. You know what I mean? Like 100%. I feel like... Um, and you're the worst thing is I've played this one, but I can't remember the time. <laughs> I don't think I ever played Emerald. I think I played ruby i think and i maybe played like the omega no i think i played sapphire and then i played omega ruby i think or no what was it oh jesus christ i don't know they use all those crazy names i know i played emerald and then i played uh, alpha sapphire and i know like the differences and similarities between the two but holy shit no <laughs> the worst thing is i remember omega no alpha cypher taking me 200 and something hours to complete but that was because i completed the pokedex in the worst way possible and the pokedex it, it was the national one kill me all right paolo what do you think are you gonna do all three or are you gonna uh, <laughs> i think i'm gonna go and attempt all three Oh shit! Trying to think on the on the hundred percent there because I know this one <laughs> is longer than the other two because you have both the magma and team aqua. Mm, right, yeah, you combine, yeah, yeah. I'm going with thirty and sixty-five. Mm. I just oh damn! I don't know. I just maybe it's double. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to think what main plus is. Or what people think is main plus. Or I think it's like Battle Frontier, maybe. Or maybe the Regis. Those take like six hours. Oh, no, yeah, those yeah. don't take as much. It's time to find out, girl. Um, <laughs> okay, let, let me put the times first. <laughs> 45. Uh, okay, I'm going to oh, go God. with 29 hours main, 45. No, 41 main plus, and 156, 100%. I Listen, like... if you get this, you deserve 10 points, not five. Holy. Yeah. <laughs> Are we ready? Okay, let's see. My, my thought is just that I'm figuring main plus might just be like double the game. Because <laughs> with Pokemon games, it's just always kind of a thing. But let's find out. Yeah. All I, right. But the thing is, is that uh, in this game, you can free match the gym leaders too. Okay. Let's you ready? Go, go, go. Main story. Uh, no, but 30 so... and a half hours. We're all okay. doing pretty darn good. Main plus extras. 66 hours. Oh. <laughs> Completionist. Oh, no researching for me this week. Ugh. I didn't do any research. <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> hey, I didn't even get enough to beat you. All right. <laughs> Completionist. Two hundred and twelve hours. Yo. I was That's thinking vile. like one's like seventy ish. I did not think we were in two hundred. <laughs> yeah, I remember immediately after that that Ariel had more broken one than Ruby and Sapphire. Well. <laughs> This is kind of like um, a bittersweet win for me right there. now because I'm like, I'm happy that I guessed right, but Rick is at 58, I'm at 56, and then Paul is at 50, so. It's still very tight. I guess I'm I got some points. <laughs> yeah. Uh, shit. All right. Well, there is another week for the How Long To Beat podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. I look forward to seeing you all next week. Toodaloos, folks. Catch you next time. Bye.